Today on Ask This Old House. Are you sick of your window air conditioner? You are not alone. I'll show you everything you need to know about installing a mini split air conditioner. Right, I got it. One of my favorite trees is a Japanese maple. I'll tell you why. In this application, I love that it's the perfect understory tree that it really gives scale to this building. It's a transition between the building and the grounds. So that's definitely a good choice. And I'll show you how to install a butcher block countertop. I slide it in nice and easy. Ready and give it a good push. Many people find air conditioning relief from something like this, a window air conditioner. You might place them strategically around a building, but they can be a bit of a pain in the neck to schlep in and out of the change of season, and they can be a security issue. But all basic air conditioners work on a simple principle. Heat always goes to cold in any direction. So inside of any air conditioner, there's two components. One is the evaporator and one is the condenser. The evaporator is cold, filled with really cold refrigerant. So in a window air conditioner like this, room air is drawn in by a fan, blown across the cold coil. The heat in the air that's in the room gets absorbed into that cold refrigerant. Heat goes to cold. Now, the heat that's now in the refrigerant gets sent out through a compressor to a condenser. Now, that condenser gets really hot. So what happens is the fan now sends outside air across that, and what does it do? It dumps the heat that used to be in the building to outside. So window air conditioning has been around for a long time, but clearly the trend in the world is to go to a thing called a split, a mini split. So all that does, it takes the two components that used to be in this box, the evaporator and the condenser, and splits them apart. This part stays inside the building, this part goes to outside, they connect by refrigerant line sets to inside and outside. So where do you put the outside condenser though? Look at this urban environment right here. Narrow sidewalk right here, you can't put it right there. This side has the parking, so there's no place on this side because of the cars. What do you do? This is a two family house and we're concentrating on putting air conditioning into just the first floor. You look around, it's really tight. The parking is right here, you worry about snow drifts. The only real backyard anybody has is right here, so you wouldn't want to put the condenser here if you could help it. And the unit is about three feet by two feet. So they make a bracket that would allow us to actually think about putting it right up here on the wall, up above people's heads, and they're really quiet. You know what we'll do? We'll probably mount it right here and leave a space right here, because I'll bet you the second floor owner will want to actually have air conditioning after they see the first floor. So that puts the outdoor unit, the condenser, the evaporator we have to place inside the building. All right, so we're looking for a spot to mount our inside unit here on the first floor. Living room's right here, kitchen's right here. This dining room is a good central location. Now many people might put that unit on the outside wall for convenience, but it means you have to run the line sets exposed on the outside of the building, and that doesn't always look that good. What I'd like to do is to put it right here in the central location on this wall above this picture high. And the reason is right here. Look at this. There's a master closet right here that is perfect for us to be able to mount it, run those lines right here. It's gonna have a line set, a condensate drain electrical wire right down here. We're gonna hide it somehow to the basement. That is the plan. Now it's time to get to work. So this is not a small job and it's not a do-it-yourself job. So we've enlisted the help of a local HVAC contractor. Joel's our mechanic and Jorge is his apprentice. So here's our parts and pieces. This is the outdoor condensing unit. This is an inverter. This can actually deliver heat into a building even when it's really cold outside, down to zero degrees. Here's that mounting bracket on the, that'll put on the back of the building that's going to allow us to hang it from the back. Just throw me that line set, would you? So here's our refrigerant line set. This is, you can see right here, it's a copper lines that have refrigerant in it that's insulated because the lines can get really cold or hot. And have a pair of these to run the refrigerant between the inside and the outside unit. Thank you, Jorge. Here's the drain. Anytime you do air conditioning, one of the net products is water that comes out of the humidity that comes out of the air, and that's condensate, and that'll go to a drain. Here's our electrical wiring. 
that'll send line voltage and control wiring to the inside unit. And here's our inside unit, perfect. All right, so that's gonna mount in our dining room and that's where we're gonna start, right? To get started, Joel's gonna mount the unit on the wall. This involves securing the bracket to the wall and marking for where the different connections will go. He can then drill the holes to run the electrical, the refrigerant line sets, and the condensate drains. All right, all right, now you can pull the line set. He'll start by the inside unit and continue on the inside of the closet and down into the basement. Now we can hang our inside unit on the wall bracket. Plenty of things going on down here. Electricians, Liam and Justin are running a new line from the panel all the way to the condenser out back. Now we presented right down here, right at the center, and you can see here's going to our condensate line. Now we're going to run this line right along the side of the joist with pitch and let the water, that condensate, drip to outside without a pump. Let gravity do its job. You can see right here, the line sets showed up perfectly right here, and it allows us to go just on the other side of the center stick. All right, so line set comes right down on this side. Now we want to get a clip to make it look nicey-nice. Joel's got a clip. Good. So it clips all the way along here, make it look sweet right against the beam. Gentle bend. Here's the last of our line set. These two coils will be cut shorter. And now we just have to mount that condenser on the wall bracket outside here. They use a special wall bracket that is mounted to the outside of the building for the condenser. They utilize blocking behind the bracket to protect the vinyl siding. How you doing? Here. I, I got okay. Now, they can mount the condenser up onto that wall bracket and make the okay. final connections. Snug her up. All right, we are getting near the finish line. We've got our unit hung. We've got refrigerant line set connections made, and we've got electrical out here. So we've got 220 volts with a service uh, switch right here. Surge protector, great thing to have. Uh, service outlet right here for plugging in an extension cord or service tool. Now, we got the electrical connections made. This printed circuit board's here. This connection is really important to be watertight, which we've done. But now, before we add the refrigerant, we have to be sure that it's absolutely clean inside the line sets. So they add nitrogen. A charge of nitrogen goes in and pressurizes the system to be sure there's no leaks. And then this vacuum pump that you hear right now will keep on pulling, 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 pulling a vacuum to evacuate all the air out of the lines, any impurities and all the nitrogen before the refrigerant is added. We're getting there. So here's our new unit, all connected. It really blends into the room. Now you control it a variety of ways. One is with a remote like this. You set the temperature you want. You can set the adjustment of the vanes and have timers. But you also can control it by your phone with Wi-Fi, and it's smart enough to diagnose itself and tell you what's going on if anything goes wrong. Now, this was not a small job. It, it never is. It took a full crew an entire day to do it. And the prices can vary depending on the size of the unit, the number of units, how much it takes to get it installed into a building, and the electrical demands you're going to have. But it is worth it. This is a way you can get quiet, comfortable cooling, dehumidification and heating in a really efficient package. Japanese maples are some of the most beautiful and imposing trees in a landscape. I absolutely love them and I have six at my own house. Japanese maples are not native to North America. They are native to Japan. And there, they've developed many different cultivars. So they're all called Acer palmatum. They all have this palmate leaf, the leaf of five. But there are several different cultivars with growing habits. Some grow outward. This one is a more dwarf variety. This is your classic blood good Japanese maple. It has that brilliant red color. You see it in a lot of landscapes around here. So there's different varieties, uprights, some that grow more outward and dwarf, and then ones that cascade down. Japanese maples grow in zones five to eight, and they also prefer partial shade. 
There are many reasons I would use a Japanese maple in a landscape plan. Uh, in this application, I love that it's the perfect understory tree that it really gives scale to this building. It's a transition between the building and the grounds. So that's definitely a good choice. And then the one we have over here is a thread leaf Japanese maple and completely different characteristic of growing. It arches over and it has this gentle slope of, of its branches and it's an amazing focal point. And where I like to place it is near a water feature or a pond or somewhere to reflect. It's beautiful. Japanese maples should be pruned in either the winter or summer. You don't want to prune it in the spring because all the new leaves are emerging and sap will be coming out. So it's safest to do winter or summer. Winter, you see the overall shape of the tree. So you can see the whole branching st structure without the leaves. And then in the summertime, you have the opportunity to see the foliage and where that's gonna shoot out and land. So this tree is gorgeous, but there's just the one piece that kind of gets in the way for me personally. So what you're gonna do is take your bypass pruners that cross over each other. And you know, if you're nervous at first, just do a, a small snip, but I know where I wanna go. So I'm gonna go right back to where it meets the other two branches and just at an angle, give it a little, and one clip can improve the overall shape. If you're looking to add character to your landscape, I would recommend a Japanese maple that fits your space. Every so often, you and home inspectors send us pictures of some of their worst home inspection nightmares, and we like to have a laugh with them. So, <laughs> what do we? <laughs> Apparently, we love to have a lot We're of laughs. Some fun. Yeah. <laughs> what do we got? Well, oh. this you know, this is supposed to be the exhaust from something inside the building, which means you got two things. One is a pipe that comes up that the stuff comes out of, and the other is the cap that lets it go. You see what's in between those two things? The roof. <laughs> the roof. <laughs> Yeah. So they they missed a, one important thing, cutting the hole. Well, it's a lot easier just to put it on the roof. <laughs> so when you have a roof vent, I always thought that it was supposed to vent the attic. Yeah. Not just the roof. I just hope this isn't combustible <laughs> materials that could make people be dead. Uh, I mean, inside. at least it won't leak. <laughs> or clog up. Also gonna bright side. It won't clog Beautiful. up. Beautiful. Uh, <laughs> lovely. All right. Who's All right. next? And that's from, that's from uh, Nolan in Canada. God rest his soul. <laughs> he he could be dead. Oh my yes. gosh, oh my what is that? So this was someone added something to the wall. Looks like insulation, insulation, insulation of some kind yep. and another finish. And normally you can just extend that electrical box and bring the device forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's simple enough. Yeah. They went through a lot of work to really do it wrong and unsafe. It looks like a couple of nails. Is that wire or a nail? I think it's wire where they stripped the end and stuck them in there like prongs of a cord cap. Mm -hmm. That's more work than moving the plug out, isn't there? And dangerous. Somebody call the insurance company. They got a claim coming their Ray, way. That was Uncle Hack that, that's, that's a fire ready to happen. <laughs> that is, yeah, that's scary. Wow. All right, right, what do we got next? All right, here Whoa. you go, huh? Huh? Uh, is this good or what? Are those skis? <laughs> that's a structural ski. This is <laughs> down is in the that? basement. Here's your main beam right there. Look at that. Yep. And the main beam has a joint in it that goes back there. Wow. Underneath that should be a support post. Yep. Oh, they, yeah, there they are. There's yeah. two of them. Well, <laughs> How does that bend? <laughs> well, that tells you. See all this black in there? That's all mold because the basement is really damp. Wow. These two buys probably were in a very damp area, and this happens very slowly. And so they've taken on the moisture so that when they come down from being so wet, they just bent like that. Oh, my this, goodness. This probably snapped right after the picture was taken. Yeah, <laughs> this could yeah. Be a, it this could be it looks like it's ready to go. Right? I've That's ever sure. seen. Yikes. All right. Well, if you've got some pictures of your worst inspection nightmares, send them to us. We'd love to have a laugh at someone else's expense. Or a cry. <laughs> yeah, that right, right. is right. terrifying. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Jared. Hey, Nathan. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. Beautiful house you have here. What year is it? 1925. Wow, it's aged really well. But uh, you guys wrote me about uh, Butcher Block Top? Yeah, come on in. We can show you. Right. Welcome to our house. Very nice. Kitchen's over there. So Nathan, you can see already we have a kitchen island that's Butcher Block. We yeah. like the look of the wood. It's nice and warm. Nice look. Um, hoping to get rid of the laminate over here and do the same. We've been meaning to for a while. Don't love it. Yeah. And that's why we 
ask you guys. Yeah, Butcher Block does look great. You know, the laminate can look dated over time and some of the newer products they've come out with look a little bit better, but really it's just MDF board layered up and that's just adhered on top so it can chip and flake over the years. Butcher Block would definitely be a nice upgrade. It's easier for us to work with uh, with woodworking tools. Uh, I think the first thing is we just disconnect the faucet and garbage disposal yep. and we'll go from there. Awesome. And then go. I'm going to start by killing the power to the garbage disposal and then disconnect it. Then I'm going to disconnect the hot and cold water lines to the faucet. All right, so we have the faucet disconnected and we also have the garbage disposal disconnected. A couple more things we can do before we pull the top out. There's a couple of clips holding in your dishwasher. We we'll want to get that stove out of the way. So Jared, if you want to get started with the clips, I'll sure. move the stove. So at first glance, it looks like this countertop doesn't really have too much holding it down, but you do have the tile backsplash, which they laid on top and they did a heavy bead of silicone. So first we want to break that seal with a knife. We'll go around, we'll loosen it up. Probably got about three quarters of an inch of overhang on this tile. So it's not gonna come out too easy, but we'll get it out. And then I think we're gonna to have to do a relief cut over here to wiggle the pieces out. So your tile's hung on drywall, so I just don't wanna to be too forceful prying because I don't wanna pop. I kinda of wanna do it slow. This is the maple butcher block top that I picked up for you guys. You can see it's a bunch of little pieces of maple all glued together. You see the seams on the end. You can see a bunch of joints on the top. Those are all finger jointed together for strength. There's a lot of options in a lot of sizes, but typical is four, eight feet, 25 inches deep. And uh, you could make it out of different materials if you wanted to. You could do teak, mahogany, but in this case, I think good old maple will really do the trick. On these tops, there's, most of the time there's an A and a B side. We want to make sure that we keep the A side up because you can see the B side has a lot of knots and wood filler on it. We want to keep that down. And then on the end, we have that little tiny piece that we need to put near the stove just to fill it out. So I'm going to use a wood connector like this. We'll mortise a hole on either side with some adhesive. We'll bond it together. It'll last forever. What do you guys think? I think it looks great. I'm excited to see it inside. All right, let's get cutting. <laughs> I'm going to use an inch and three eighths portioner bit to make quick work of this little mortise. And then I'm going to clean up the edges with a chisel. All right, slide it in nice and easy. Ready and give it a good push. Now we can cut out the sink. What's great about the one you picked out is it comes with a stencil, which will make it a breeze for installation. You might notice that I have a piece of strapping across the butcher block top. That's to prevent the cutout from falling down and landing on the plumbing below. that up and you can have a nice cutting board. Great. All 
All right, guys, butcher blocks in, secured from underneath, even got the sink in place. What do you guys think? Looks amazing. It's just what we were hoping for. Great. Well, first, a little bit of homework. We're going to bring a plumber in, and we need to make those connections up and also put some sort of a finish on it and make sure that it's food grade safe, even if you don't plan on cutting on it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nathan. We're so excited to You're be welcome. cooking in here soon. You're welcome. Enjoy. Thanks. I can't wait. This is awesome. That's a nice transformation right there. Thank Good you. job, Nathan. Although you left them a little work to do. You did not finish it right then. Yeah, there's a little bit of homework. You have to you have to finish this. You can't leave it unfinished because it's going to stain very easily. And when it comes to finish, in my opinion, there's only one option, and that's mineral oil. Food grade, food safe. And it's going to take some it's going to take a little while to build those layers up. And so why not something like a, a polyurethane, a lot more durable, it's near water. So when we say food grade, food safe, we're thinking about food coming in contact with that and we don't want any toxic materials getting on our sandwiches when we're making it. Or say someone does cut on it by a mistake, breaking that up and getting it into our food. So mineral oil, not toxic. What actually goes into this stuff? Surprisingly, it's a byproduct of petroleum oil, and it's almost in everything in our daily use. It's in our makeups, our lipsticks, even all the way down to gummy bears. Really? It's not my lipstick, pal. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that's what we're gonna use. Um, so I had mentioned, we gotta build it up. We yeah. gotta build it up in a few different layers. Um, they say for cutting boards, between four and six layers before you start cutting on it. For our countertops, we could probably do two or three, and then see what we think of the uh, of the finish on it. And then after that, monthly maintenance, about once a month. Well, let's see you put some on, and I'll take a look at your technique as you do. So for this application, we've got a big wide open area. I'm just gonna use a squeegee, put a little drizzle on, and start to spread it out, work it back and forth. Gotcha. So now that we have it spread out, I'm just gonna take a rag to start to buff it off. So work it with the knife first, and then buff it in. Here, why don't you hand me both of those, and I'll see if I, give me the knife too, I'll give it a try. Not much of a change in the color, so you're not going to get that, uh, you know, a darker stain. No, this is pretty light, but they do have, there is a manufacturer who makes one that has tongue oil and resin combined, mm -hmm. and that will darken it up, seal and finish it. Is that food safe? Some are, some aren't. You definitely want to read the label and make sure that it is. Right. All right. Well, nice look uh, and nice tips. Thank you, Nathan. You're welcome. All right. That's it for us. So join us next time. Until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Nathan Gilbert. For Ask This Old House. I really can't. Next time on Ask This Old House. Looking at this, I gotta tell you, this is kind of an electrician's nightmare. We have a 120 volt splice inside of there instead of something safer like a landscape splice that's 12 volts. This lamppost isn't exactly installed to code. I'll show you how to install a new one. These steps are sloped, falling apart, and growing weeds. I'll show you how to replace them. And an old piece of furniture like this can have a new life. With some hard work, a little bit of paint, and I'll show you how.